as well when, when he's needed. So appreciate uh, his willingness to serve. So my inspirational story this morning, I know it's football, but this is baseball. Bob and the Lord stood by to observe a baseball game. The Lord's team was playing Satan's team. The Lord's team was at bat. The score was tied 0-0 zero to zero and it was the bottom of the ninth. Two outs. They continued to watch as a batter stepped up to the plate whose name was Love. Love swung at the first pitch and hit a single because love never fails. The next batter was named Faith, who also got a single because faith works with love. The next batter was up named Godly Wisdom. Satan wound up and threw the first pitch. Godly wisdom looked it over and let it pass. Ball one. Three more pitches and godly wisdom walk because godly wisdom never swings at what Satan throws. The bases were loaded. The Lord then turned to Bob and told him he was now going to bring in the star player. Up to the plate stepped Grace. Bob said, he sure doesn't look like much. Satan's whole team relaxed when they saw Grace, thinking he had won the game Satan wound up and fired his first pitch. To the shock of everyone, Grace hit the ball harder than anyone had ever seen. But Satan was not worried. His center fielder let very few get by. He went up for the ball, but it went right through his glove, hit him on the head, and sent him crashing on the ground. Then it continued over the fence for a home run. The Lord's team won. The Lord then asked Bob if he knew why love, faith, and godly wisdom could get on base but could not win the game. Bob answered that he did not know why. The Lord explained, If your love, faith, and wisdom had won the game, you would think you had done it by yourself. Love, faith, and wisdom will get you on base, but only my grace can get you home. My grace is the one thing Satan cannot steal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. Wow, without that, we are nothing. We can't do anything on our own. We rely solely on you. We just ask that Pastor Scott's message would just touch us, touch us in a special way. And we thank you for the healing of Pastor Steve. We pray all these things in your holy son's precious name. Amen. Good morning. Um, Today we'd like to introduce two songs that might be well out of many of yours wheelhouse. Um, and for me, I thought they were a little bit far, but then I just love the message in both those songs. So we, we took the hit and we're going to introduce two songs for you and then we'll start our worship. So if you know these songs, please join in. But if you don't, feel free to just listen and, and pray with the word. For God so loved. <coughs>
are going to introduce is Reckless Love. And when it was first introduced to me, I thought, I don't really think I like the idea of God being reckless. But then when I looked at the song and you introduced it and you started thinking about what the words meant, then you could see that God's love isn't really reckless. He's just not caring about the consequences. If he finds you lost and you don't want to know where he is and you don't feel welcome in his church, he comes looking for you regardless of this cost. For God said he gave his only son to die for us, John 3, 16. For God so loved, he gave his only son to die for us. The consequences were not too great for him. He didn't think it was an unwise. He was reckless with his love and came and found each one of us and brought us home. So the next song, Reckless Love, um, I think you'll find the words very impactful. Serve it, still you give yourself away. 
Snow no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Snow wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Snow shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Snow wall you won't kick down. nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not <coughs> wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Join us in our first song. Oh 
Well, good morning, friends. So good to be together. And uh, I just want to help you. The, uh, the bulletin says that Scott Gould uh, is here uh, for leaning us in worship. So I want to help you lean today. So uh, let's just all lean a little bit this way. Can we do that? Okay. Uh, did, did anybody lean? I didn't see you. Can I see you lean that away? Can, can I watch you all do that? Okay. There's a song that I grew up singing. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. So if I can help you lean that away, that's the best way for us to lean. So we have our confession of sins. It's in front of us. Let us acknowledge uh, the sin, uh, the confession on page two. It's on the screen. Let's confess together out loud from our hearts in an agreement. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. And that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy. And ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will. And true obedience to your word. To the end, that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. It is good to confess our sins. And a very good declaration of grace is found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God Almighty is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So would you in your heart, in your mind, even in your whole body, would you receive the grace of God through Jesus Christ? Amen? Amen. 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 I would invite you at this time, I believe, uh, to be seated. And let's turn to the Word of God together. So the Old Testament lesson is from, from Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness and in uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that send out, sends out its roots by the stem and does not fear from or when heat comes. For it, le- for it leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 20. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe, believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in acceptance with the scriptures, and that, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve, then to the twelve. Then he appeared more than five hundred appeared to more than five hundred brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, not it was I, but the grace of God that was in me. 
whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be mispresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even God has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is fulfilled, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And could we stand for the reading of the gospel found in the gospel of Luke, chapter 6? And beginning with the 17th verse, again, Luke chapter 6. Beginning with the 17th verse. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out of him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is in is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. And woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. And woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. And here ends the reading of God's word. Would you remain standing as we would together with boldness and with confidence and with joy confess our faith together according to the Apostles' Creed. Let us acknowledge what we believe together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And I believe in Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated, and I would invite the children to come forward at this time, and let's enjoy a few minutes together, boys and girls. I really kind of like the way that children's sermons are done uh, because it's kind of preparing you for your confirmation because there will be a day where you will have to stand in front of believers here and acknowledge what you believe. And that's good training for you. Even right now, while everyone's listening to me, uh, all of my attention is on you. And I want you to know that, that that's how God the Father is. His attention is on you. When I was in second grade, how many of you are in second grade? I res right now, how many of you are in second grade? I'm not in second grade right now. How many of you? Raise your hand really high. I'm in second grade. Okay. When I was in second grade, I received a blue Bible. And uh, in that Bible is the, the, the first reading, the call to worship, Psalm 1. And that year of second grade, in the school that I went to, we memorized Psalm 1. One. How many of you have Psalm 1 memorized? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And what I'd like you to do next is I'd like you all to stand up. For he is like a tree. Would you stand up and just make yourself into a tree planted by streams of living water, which yield its, none of you are looking like trees over here, yield its fruit in season. <laughs> but not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. You may be seated now. When you think of chaff that the wind is blowing away, what, what, what's happening to chaff? Why is it blowing away? Chaff is like dead it's kind of like the corn stalk. You know, after the, the harvest, you've got that chaff that the wind is just blowing away. Okay, so how many of you have ever heard a song with those words in it? This week, one opportunity for you, if, if any of you are willing to, is to write what possibly is one of the first songs ever written in Psalm 1. Does anyone know a, a song from Psalm 1? I find it interesting that the first psalm I don't know a song from Psalm 1. I don't know one. But there, we're going to talk about a few other songs that come out of the, the Bible today. And really, I have a question today. Why do we sing? Why do we sing songs? Tell me. Well, we sing to praise God. That's good. But there are a lot of other songs that are sung, not in the church, that do not give God praise at all. Why do we sing, do you think? Does every culture in the world, every people group, sing? What do you think? Does every culture and every people group in the world talk? All that a song is, is talk put to music. And so realistically, do you know what they have found? Every culture, every people group all around the world sings. And the reason that we sing songs sometimes is to help us remember statements. Sometimes songs help us remember statements. And do you know that that is why the church sings principally? The principal reason that the church sings is to help us remember the word of God. And, and then in that, to give God our worship. There is a, a, a song that I want to sing for you. It's taken from Lamentations chapter 3. Grandpas and grandmas, moms and dads, if you know it, brothers and sisters... The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 22 and 23. How many of you knew that song? I've got one. Did you sing it with me? No, I can't sing. Well, that is not a good excuse for that at all. 
How, did anybody, does anybody else know that song at all? Could, could we try to learn it? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Do you know what we just had right there? We had choir practice. Ha! That's so good. We just did. And now we can all go enjoy spaghetti. Uh, that's coming. One last question for you, boys and girls. Where does a song come from? Tell me. A song comes from the Lord. I like that answer. What's your answer? The Lord. That's a good answer. Did you copy his answer? Oh, from the heart. Ooh, I kind of like that answer, buddy. Where does a song come from? My mouth. From your mouth, good answer. Where does a song come from? That's a really good, all of these are really good answers. Where does a song come from? We've got the know-it-all right here. It comes from the one who sings it. That is a great answer. Okay, boys and girls, we're going to pray in just a minute. All of those answers are right. Boys and girls, I want you to recognize that you have the opportunity to learn songs that come from the Word of God so that the song can come from you, that you could be the one singing it. And some of you in this room are really able to be song writers, that you would write songs of praise and worship, maybe some new hymns for the church. <coughs> Songs that could come from the word of God out of your mouth, giving God worship and praise. God loves it when we sing to him. With that in mind, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these songs, Lord, that we've been singing today as a congregation. And I thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to sing songs from our heart with our mouths. Oh God, with our minds, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you help us not only to sing, but to believe by faith and to trust you, God, as we sing, as we live. Oh God, may each of these boys and girls, may we as moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas, aunts and uncles and neighbors and church members, God, may we not only sing, but may we believe and worship you all day long because of your word that we believe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, you may be seated. And again, it is my desire to help us today. The worship team's going to lead us in one more song. But as I'm here, I want to help you lean on the everlasting arms. Let's continue to do that today as we would continue.
I'd ask you to pray with me as we continue. Father God, may it be that each one of us would know that you are near to us today. Lord God, that we would sense, oh, more than sense. Holy Spirit, help us to trust and to believe, God, in your nearness. God, thank you that we know that you are present, for we are more than two or three gathered together in the mighty name of of Jesus Christ. And so we know that you are here. Jesus, help us to know. Lord Jesus, as we continue this week, help us to know your nearness. Lord Jesus, help us. Help us. Holy Spirit, we need your guiding work now as we would dig into your living word, O oh God. Be pleased, Father. Be pleased with what we think about, what we meditate on. Be pleased right now. Help us, Lord, with our minds to stay focused on your word. Help us right now, Father. Help us, we pray. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And the saints agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Two friends of mine uh, over the last few weeks uh, unfortunately had to come to St. Paul's for a funeral for their 48 and a half year old daughter that they had cared for in their home passed away. Uh, she developed pneumonia and uh, we all assumed that her body would be able to defeat pneumonia, but unfortunately her body did not uh, improve. It actually one day decreased in, in health, her, her lungs uh, decreased and the doctors came and said she is going to die. And so we gathered and I've been talking with uh, her two brothers that are around her age and mine. And I've been talking with her parents, you know, every other day or so just to check in how are we doing. And her father this week, I was really saddened to hear him say these words. I'm wondering, he's been saying these words every time I talk to him. I'm really wondering if I did enough. But then he said this line, I'm really wondering if she made it. And how many of you moms and dads have that curiosity this season, wondering if your kids have really made it to Jesus in this life, if they've really come to the point of knowing and trusting and believing in Jesus? 
Well, what I know about their daughter is she loved Jesus. She had received Jesus as her Savior and as her Lord. She was a, if you will, a confessional Christian. She believed. And so by the very basis of Scripture, we know, ha, we know that she's in heaven for eternity. But her father, because of his grief and his own, you know, how many of you as dads can relate to my friend? You know, at times we're just, you know, moms, at times we're just kind of weak-minded. Her mother is strong-minded. And she said, you know what, I'm not wondering about whether, she said, rather I'm wondering how her new body looks. How her new activities are, you know, leaping and praising God all day long, all for eternity. So her mother was focused on the spiritual truth of Scripture. Her father was based upon, was, was thinking about what his feelings were leading him to hold on to in grief. Many of us have the same issues as both of my friends Many of us at times are just only thinking and feeling what is natural. But hopefully, as we continue in our Christian faith, we become more like the mother. We become more willing to allow the Word of God to be that firm foundation. And hopefully, we continue to be people who are leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Hopefully that's what we're becoming. This morning I have a very simple sermon. It's called Practical Worship. Because worship can be practical. It doesn't just need to be for an hour in church. But it's practical. Just like Bible memorization is practical. I can memorize Psalm 1 as a second grader, and today I'm rehearsing Psalm 1 with my children around the breakfast table every day. And we're rehearsing Psalm 8 and Psalm 23, and we're working on Psalm 32 as a family. Practical worship, something that we practice, something that we learn how to do. Well, I want to invite you, as we think about these two ideas, that worship is both practice and its performance. If you have a Bible, would you turn with me to the book of Psalms now, looking at Psalm 57. I hope you have your Bible. I'm thankful I remembered mine. And uh, Psalm 57, we're going to look at just a few of the verses, not all 11, but uh, verse 1 is something that's very important. It's, uh, the psalmist writes, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. Practice makes ready. Uh, I was in a choir in college, and every day at the beginning of choir practice, we would warm up our voices so that we were ready to sing whatever the choir director wanted us to sing. La, 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 la. We would do that every day. And, and on and on and on, we would practice. Practice makes ready. Warming up your voice. We would do something interesting most mornings in choir practice, we would turn, and I'm going to invite you to do this if you're willing. Turn to the person on your left. Here, I need to get to my wife. Um, and she, I get to be on both sides of her. Uh, which way would your left be? Okay. And we would, we would rub the shoulders of the person on our left. And then we would turn to the person on our right. And we would rub the shoulders of the person on our right. And why would we do that? Because we were going to be standing next to those people the whole year in concerts, in practice, and we were getting comfortable with one another so that we could actually share our voices. And we had to kind of learn how to share our love. And so as we read Psalm 57 verse 1, practice this with me. Would you say these words to God right now? Be merciful to me, O God. Say those words with me. Be merciful to me, O God. 
And the psalmist doesn't just say it once, he says it twice. Because I don't know about you, but I say it the first time, and then my own mind and the devil lies to me. He's not going to be merciful to you. And so sometimes, like the psalmist, we need to say it twice. Oh God, be merciful to me. And then he reminds us of what we can do. He says, for in you, my soul takes refuge. Not in my money, not in my house, not in my car, not in my title, not in my family, but in you, Lord God, my soul takes refuge. And then he continues, in the shadow of your wings, he sees the Lord God stretched out. Wings, arm, his, his loving arms, wide open. I'm leaning in the shadow of your wings. I'm leaning on you, Lord. And then he says it again, remind himself, I will take refuge. And then notice what he says next. Till the storms of destruction pass by. Practice involves, for the Christian, it involves reading, meditating, and memorizing the Word of God. That's our practice. I don't know about you, but I need to practice. I cannot just go on what I learned uh, in my confirmation years. I've got to practice. I've got to wake up in the morning with my journal and my Bible and read the Word of God and meditate on it like a cow with four stomachs. I've got to read a little bit kind of work on it and then kind of swallow it and then allow it to come back up and read it a little bit more, meditating, ruminating on the Word of God, memorizing it, hiding it in my heart. Practice involves reading, meditating, and memorizing. It's kind of like getting dressed. I didn't just arrive with this outfit on. Some of you assume that my wife picked out my tie and my my, no, 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 no. My mama taught me, pick out your outfit the night before and lay it out so you're ready in the morning. So I had to choose what I was going to wear. And practice in, involves getting dressed and choosing what is the armor that you're going to wear. What are you going to clothe yourself in today? Practice involves getting dressed. And then what you have decided that is going to be a very important piece of your armor, take it with you. Nearly everywhere that I go, I bring the Bible. Not just an app on my phone, although I do have the YouVersion Bible app on my phone. But I bring this with me almost everywhere that I go. Because if we're practicing, then we're going to be ready. We want to be ready for what's going on. And the psalmist writes... Be merciful to me. In you I take refuge. And then notice the last part of what he says in verse 1. Till the storms of destruction pass by. Now, Gifford knows about a tornado. Now, I'm sure many of you know about some pretty big storms of destruction. Not just weather storms, but storms in your own physical body. Your pastor is in the middle of a storm of destruction with his heart. And he is learning in this season a new opportunity to take refuge in the Lord as he gets ready for surgery on Friday. In you, Lord God, and in you alone I take refuge. Not in the doctors, but in you, Lord God, I take refuge. Till this storm passes by. Practice is very, very, very important. And I want to add, it cannot just be every 15 years. I confirmed my faith as a 15-year-old in front of the congregation, and I stood and I acknowledged, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Actually, I did stand at the lectern when I gave my confirmation speech. I'll tell you that a week ago, Friday, I did something that I had not done for 15 years. And that was a very interesting day. If 15 years go by and you haven't done something, you become kind of uncertain, kind of nervous, maybe kind of slow. But if you do something every single day and you repeat it, you're ready. What I did last Friday is I took my boys, five of them and I, and we drove up to Wisconsin. Do you remember what was going on last Thursday all around here? There was a nice big snowstorm. 
And we drove up to Wisconsin because we were going to go snowboarding and skiing all day on Friday. And so we were not going to allow a snowstorm to keep us from the hill. And uh, for the first time in 15 years, I strapped a snowboard to my feet. And I was really slow going down the hill, and the video would show it. Boy, that looks like an old man going down that hill. You know, and i honest with you, I, I had not snowboarded in 15 years. I started skiing when I was a young teenager, so I can put on skis and go. But snowboarding, ugh. I was a little, I was rusty all day long. Some of us need a reminder that we need a daily practice of being in the Word, a daily practice of reading and meditating and memorizing the Word of God because the first point in your notes is that practice makes ready. The second point is that performance is daily life. Your life as a human is your performance. It's not just when you're up on stage. It's not just when you punch in. It's not just when you're, you know, moms or dads, when you're doing the household chores. That's not the only performance. It's all day long. It's daily life as a Christ follower. Our daily life is our performance and our practice makes us ready. If your Bibles are open, would you look at verse 7 in Psalm 57? It's a very, very, very simple statement. David writes, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. And my question as I look at David, I want to ask him, how did you get there? David, how did you get to the point where you could say twice, my heart is steadfast. I'm not wavering. I'm not, I'm not changing. I'm not, I'm not slipping away. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. My heart is steadfast. Oh, God. How did David get there? Well, we could go back to Psalm 1 and learn. What, what, did, what did David write in Psalm 1? Blessed is the man. He will be like a tree planted by streams of living water which yield its fruit in season. Whatever he does, he prospers. Okay, that's verse 7. Look back with me at verses 4 and 5 and 6 for just a moment. In Psalm 57, verse 4, David writes, My soul is in the midst of lions. I don't believe that David was really at the zoo where there's lions and tigers and bears. Thank you, I was waiting for that. I forgot to tell them that they had a line in the middle of the sermon. I don't believe he was really in lions. As we continue to read, look at what he says. I lie down amid fiery beasts. But then he clarifies the children of man. David is surrounded by people who are, he knows, going to kill him. More about that in a minute. But it's interesting if we think to what David has written earlier in Psalm 23. Uh, how does Psalm 23 go? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me He doesn't say that he makes me lie down amidst the lions. So where's the Lord here in Psalm 57? Think about that. When we're in the middle of a big storm where there's destruction, where's the Lord? When people are against us, when our neighbors are against us, when there is a family feud over land, where is the Lord? When people are beginning to part ways, and they're no longer talking. Where is, and they're Christians. Where is Jesus? Where is the Lord God Almighty? David clarifies where he is. My heart is steadfast, O Lord. My heart is steadfast. In you I take refuge. Look at what David says in verse 5. He's lying amidst lions the children of men who are against him and he writes these words be exalted oh god 
above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. Sing it with me again. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be over all the earth. Performance is daily life. It's not just an hour in church. It's not just Bible study time. It's not just in our prayer closet. Performance is daily life in the middle of the destroying storm. That's when we need to get to that point of praising the Lord. And exalting Him. Giving Him our attention. This Psalm 57 is taken out of a story that happens in Psalm 24, and we'll conclude with this. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, David is not king. Well, he'd actually been anointed, but King Saul and 3,000 men are chasing David. And they are going to do one thing. They're going to kill David. And that's why David said that I am lying amidst lions, fierce lions, whose teeth are sharp because they're going to kill him. Now, the very specific story in 1 Samuel 24 that we get Psalm 57, David's writing about a time where he had, if you will, gone into a cave and it would seem to go to the bathroom. And he was there for a long time. And he was back in the back part of the cave. And they were hiding. All the men were there. All of David's few men were there. And then Saul actually needed to go and relieve himself as well. And so Saul's in there in the dark cave, standing, if you will, just a few feet from David. And David's men tell David, kill him. You got, the Lord has delivered Saul into your hands. Your enemy is right here. Take his life. And David says, far be it from me to lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. And David, something happens to David that we read about in Psalm 57. Verse 6. He writes that they set a net for my steps. But my soul was bowed down. They had dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. So the 3,000 men are there surrounding David and his small little motley crew. And Saul is right there and David could have taken his life. But David says, my soul was bowed down. And in the Hebrew, that word is used in various places throughout the scriptures to clarify that at times we, we know the right thing to do, but, but we have an opportunity to do something that just even looks better. The right thing to do in that moment was to take Saul's life. That was the right thing. They're in the middle of a battle. And sometimes we don't need just the right thing. We need the best Thing to do. And that will only happen if our soul is bent down and we are brought to the place where we are willing to live practical worship out. Where we live bowed down. We live that way. Where no longer are we just looking at what's in front of us, but our gaze is constantly lifted by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we're not just dealing with what's right here, those lions surrounding us, but our gaze is lifted up to Jesus. I believe that that story is helpful for us as we look at our culture, as we look at all that's going on around us. 
What happened inside of David is that his pride and his humility collided and his soul was bowed over, bowed down. There was a collision inside. And as you are a person that is allowing practice to make you ready, you're going to live out and have a life of performing worship that's practical. Other people are going to see it. And they're they're not always going to agree with your choices. As you follow Jesus, the world around you is not always going to agree with your choices. And that's why we are here today, to encourage one another. And so, maybe just a few concluding statements. What do we do? What do we do? We worship amidst the destruction and the storms that are going on, taking shelter, leaning into the everlasting arms of God. And at times, my wife said it this week, we make lemonade out of the lemons that the Lord gives us. We rely upon God's word, not just our emotions. We practice with Bible reading, relying upon the truth, looking to the truth, and then you and I can become like the ones that were up in front here in our showers, in our cars, in our combines. In the middle of a conflict, we can be worship leaders. Singing, leading our own soul to worship God. For the very spiritual truths of the word of God are essential today. And so with all of this in mind, as we have talked about practical worship today, We've talked about becoming songwriters today, worship leaders today. I want to invite you right now. Would you bow your heads and would you invite God with me as we pray? Father God, right now we ask that you would be merciful to each one of us, God. You know our circumstances. Oh God, you know what we're each going to be doing later on today, and we ask you to be merciful to us in the midst of the storms of our lives. Oh God, would you be merciful to us, and would you teach us, like you taught David, to find shelter in you, to find you as a place of refuge in the shadow of your wings, learning to lean upon your everlasting arms. Oh God, would you help each and every one of us and tomorrow and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday and on Saturday. Oh God, would you bring us into practice with you in your word and then produce a song in our hearts. Oh God, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to invite you to just to continue to bow your head with me. And even in your own way, would you allow your heart and your soul maybe even to be bowed down? And so let's turn to the Lord. Let's truly, in our own hearts, turn to the Lord. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, to bring you our legitimate concerns. Lord, we've been scanning maybe some of us, scanning the, the feeds, Lord, the, on Twitter or Facebook. Some of us read the daily uh, papers. We look at various things, God, all around the world. And we see the reports from the persecuted church, Lord. And we recognize that brothers and sisters all around the world have been and are being persecuted simply because they have a Bible simply because they go with other Christians and they worship you. And Lord God, we come to you and we ask for mercy on behalf of our brothers and sisters in Christ, in India, in Bangladesh, in China, in North Korea, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Oh God, we could continue to name the nations that are red hot with hostility against the brothers and sisters of ours. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to help each Christian all around the world today. We, we yield to you, God, and we ask you for mercy. God, strengthen the pastors all around the nation, all around the nations, Lord God. And here in the United States, God, we pray on behalf of the Christians. Oh, God, in each of the 50 states, we pray that you would give Christians in every state conviction from your word to continue to live their lives bowed down before you. May their souls and our souls be bowed and bent over, Lord. Not just doing what's easy, but God, doing what would please you. Oh God, would you produce in the hearts of the Christian pastors in the United States of America, produce an obedience of faith. Thank you, God. And Lord God, I thank you for the AFLC today. We thank you for the pastors who are serving faithfully. Oh God, we stand in, in, in agreement, thanking you for, our, for President Lyndon Cornyn, God, and for rest, the rest of the directors at the headquarters. Lord God, thank you for the AFLC and our willingness to continue to hold up your word as our standard and as our norm for faith and for life. Lord God, I thank you for St. John. Thank you, God, for the congregation here. Thank you for abled-bodied men and women who are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with a, an earnest faith in you, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the teenagers and their willingness to put on a Valentine's lunch today. God, I thank you for the church council here and for their faithfulness to you and to your word. Lord God, we thank you for Pastor Steve Jensen and his... Wife Brandy, thank you, God, for their household. Thank you for their, their willingness, God, and your call on their lives to serve here for such a time as this. Lord, we lift up Pastor Steve Jensen's surgery this coming Friday at 11 o'clock. And Father, we ask in Jesus' name, great physician, would you perform surgery each and every moment of each day leading up to that surgery and each moment coming out of that surgery. Thank you, Lord God. We trust your miraculous and supernatural work preserving Pastor Jensen and giving him, oh God, we pray that you would give him clarity and wisdom and let him know you these days. God, use this time out, this time away from his normal activities for your purposes. And now, Lord Jesus Christ, hear us as we continue to pray the prayer that you've taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. If you want to stand and join us all in our last song, You Are My King.
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And now, go in peace, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.